Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is David Sam Beck. I'm Lead Industry and Service Officer at the APO. Thank you so much for joining our P-Talk today on cybersecurity for productivity. Cyber attacks happen everywhere, a lot more often than we probably imagine. Once a cyber attack occurs, the price that we may have to pay can be daunting. It is therefore crucial to know how to adopt the cybersecurity measures in your workplace and in your home. This has a lot to do with uh, productivity as well. Damage and delays caused by successful cyber attacks can affect work productivity and day-to-day -day transactions. Mm -hmm. To help you to understand this topic better, I invited Chris Kim, Managing Director of Cyro for a cybersecurity company at MP Core Korea, and Mijong Hibits from Robert and William to give us an overview of cyber attack prevention and its relevance to productivity. Chris and Mijong, thank you so much for your time. The floor is yours. Bob is sleeping soundly. The alarm goes off at 6 a.m. He wakes up and prepares to go to work. He wanted to make morning coffee, but the coffee ran out. He got dressed and went to the parking lot, but realized his car key is missing. He went out on the street to get a taxi, but doesn't see a single car. He ran to the office, but arrived late for the client meeting. He heads for the next meeting in the auditorium. His computer suddenly malfunctions during the presentation. Ransomware attack message is displayed on the screen. Bob, terrified, wakes up. The alarm clock rings at 6 a.m. Bob checks his coffee, car keys, and computer. He is relieved to find out everything is normal. Bad dream? You don't want to wait until it becomes a reality. Thank you, David. Okay, let me start my uh, you know, presentation. First of all, I'd like to thank the Asian Productivity Organizations for giving us an opportunity to talk about cybersecurity issues today. Uh, as you can see from the title of today's presentation, Ransomware on the Rise. I will speak on ransomware attacks that have recently increased worldwide today. Without further ado, I will talk about table of contents in the next slide. Today's presentation is composed of mainly three parts. In the first part, I will discuss ransomware cases, details of those cases, and then a little bit of ransomware today. And Mijong will talk about trends of ransomware attacks by illustrating some statistics in the second part. In the third part, I will discuss some basic ways to prevent ransomware attacks and ransomware trend you should be aware of. Lastly, Mijong and I will answer any questions during the Q&A session with David. And so uh, I'd like to uh, first talk about the, uh, the most recent ransomware attacks happened in the United States that you may have heard of. As you can see on the map to the right, Colonial Pipeline is a company that supplies oil from Texas to major cities in the northeastern region of the United States. On May the 7th, Dark Side Hacking Group notified Colonial Pipeline that its internal network had been compromised. They also demanded $4. million for restoration. Darkside is a cyber criminal hacking group believed to be based in Eastern Europe that targets victims using ransomware and extortion. It is believed to be behind the Colonial Pipeline cyber attack and the recent attack on a Toshiba unit. The group provides ransomware as a services. Colonial Pipeline paid $4.4 million to this hacking group and until it was restored. The attack caused tremendously direct and indirect damage, including business disruptions, delays in flight, due to shortage of oil, 
and gasoline price hike. Uh, let's take a look at uh, how this ransomware attack happened in the next few slides. I just wanted to uh, bring another recent ransomware incident to your attention. As you can see on the world map to the right, JBS is a multinational corporation headquartered in Brazil with meat processing plant around the globe. On May 30th, less than a month after the colonial pipeline breach, the dark side hacking group again demanded $11 million from JBS. JBS plant in the United States, Canada, and Australia have been shut down due to this ransomware incident. As a result, JBS paid the ransom demanded by the hacking group to minimize damage and recover what's been compromised. During this period, the company's important information was exfiltrated and encrypted, which resulted in the suspension of factory operations and increase in meat prices. Let's see how the hacking group was able to strike the cyber attack. To simply put, uh, the hacking group sophisticatedly planned and secretly infiltrated into the target users of the company. According to the FBI report, the hacking group first used social engineering techniques to gain access to the internal network of the company's regular employees. The hacking group had a lateral movement period for uh, several weeks after they successfully infiltrated the internal network. And then the final target was selected among those high-level access users who are profiled during this lateral movement. This process was done by the remote desktop tools, as we know. Even after the final target was selected, the hacking group deliberately waited again for some time to get the perfect opportunities. The hacking group even conducted simulation exercises for the final strike. Finally, on D-Day, they made a final strike by exfiltrating, encrypting data, and then demanded $11 million. Um, yeah, looking at the network topology of co uh, Colonial Pipeline, we know that the hacking group obtained the company's general user's credential and finally carried out ransomware attack on the operation technology network servers with the access right of uh, employees with a higher credential. Colonial Pipeline has taken the system as indicated in the red box offline to prevent further damage after realizing the breach by ransomware. These measures led to the oil supply interruption. Uh, this slide shows an overview of oil and gas pipeline system in the United States and red circled area with the title of cyber attack are vulnerable to the cyber attacks. Again, this colonial pipeline ransomware attack took place in the part marked cyber attack here in this uh, slide. And let me briefly talk about what ransomware is. Ransomware is a type of malware that can either encrypt all of your data or log you out of computer. Once the ransomware has infected your computer, it will ask you to pay a ransom, usually in cryptocurrency. In exchange for de decrypting your data, or unlocking your computer. Looking at the graph on the left, viruses, spyware, and adware, which we have heard of a lot, belong to malware category like ransomware. The figure to the right shows more details types of malware, including ransomware. The graph on the left shows which threats have been emerged and how harmful they have been over time. Before the 2000s, damage was mainly caused by viruses, but after that, worms were prevalent. And in the mid-2000s, 
DDoS attacks occurred in various places, including South Korea. And around 2009, breaches that evolved into APT attacks occurred all over the world, including South Korea again. A, uh, advanced persistent threat, so-called APT, is a, a stealthy uh, threat or actor, typically a nation state or state-sponsored group which gains unauthorized access to a computer network and remains undetected for an extended period of time. In recent times, the term may also refer to non-state-sponsored group conducting large-scale targeted intrusions to achieve specific goals. Let's say, uh, for instance, uh, in 2014, uh, there, were, there was a, a data leak due to the APT attack on the Korea hydro and nuclear power plants. In the same year, uh, Sony Studio was also attacked by APT, which leaked movie-related information. Lastly, uh, there was the WannaCry ransomware attack that took place globally between year 2017 and 2018. The small graph on the right shows security threat trends. As the attack type trend evolves, it appears that intelligence level has increased accordingly. In particular, there is an uh, APT attack located at the end of the arrow and recently, uh, ransomware is also targeted following the pattern of the such APT attack and include latency or lateral movement. And this slide shows how ransomware started and how it has evolved. In particular, it should be noted that after the commercialization of Android-based cell phones and the subsequent release of the Bitcoin network, the number of incidents related to ransomware has exploded. Therefore, we can speculate that cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin may be connected to what is commonly known as ransomware. Along this line, uh, there are the Colonial Pipeline and JBS ransomware incidents. Okay, uh, from, uh, from the next slide, Mi Jung can talk about ransomware market trends by sharing some relevant statistics to you. Chris has explained earlier what ransomware is and how it has evolved and also a few high-stake ransomware attacks happened in the United States. Uh, in this slide, uh, let me show the scale of the damages done on global economy by ransomware. As you can see uh, in the graph, uh, sourced from Cybersecurity Venture, uh, which is the world's leading research and publishing organization, ransomware damage and cost uh, have been growing worldwide uh, from $325 million in 2015 to $20 billion this year in 2021. So this accounts for about 15% of the total damage caused by cyber attacks. Additionally, uh, experts uh, predict the amount of ransomware damage would increase rapidly. So uh, in about 10 years from now, uh, in 2031, it will uh, reach about $265 billion. Now, another way to see economic damage or negative impact caused by ransomware is to see it in terms of how long it will take for victim organizations or companies uh, to recover from the attacks and how much it would cost. According to a research shown here, uh, approximately 40% of the victims spend average two to three days in recovering data after a ransomware attack. And about total 41% would take a week and more to recover. In terms of cost, average recovery cost of a ransomware cost downtime per incident has been increasing each year. And this year alone, the cost was about $380,000. Now, we need to look at this data from organizations' 
productivity point of view, if you were to be targeted by ransomware, regardless of your ransomware payouts, you would spend average two to three days, and in some cases more than one week, just in recovering lost data and et cetera. And the cost associated with that would be about $380,000. I'm not sure how big the organization you belong to. Many small, medium-sized enterprises, this is a significant loss of productivity. There are also a lot more damages that are beyond immediate economic damages, such as negative publicity and loss of customer trust, and et cetera. Therefore, today's cybersecurity issue, particularly ransomware attack, can be a, sometimes a matter of survival for some SMEs. And it is something that every business should pay close attention to and discuss seriously about prevention strategy and measures in the organization. But still, I have seen some CEOs or COOs saying, uh, well, you know, we are a small company. Uh, why would cyber criminals attack us? and the probability of us being attacked by cyber criminals is not significant. So at this stage of our business, we don't have enough resources to allocate for purchasing cybersecurity products. But if we look at uh, 2021 global cyber attack trends here, uh, you will see that malware attacks worldwide actually have gone down compared to the previous year by 22%. However, intrusion attempts have increased by 9% to 2.5 trillion attempts, and IoT attacks increased 59% to 32.2 million. Particularly, ransomware attacks increased by 151% compared to the previous year. These attacks are unknown and hard to detect. And if you recall what Chris has explained earlier, Ransomware attacks typically follow advanced persistent threat, APT type of attacks, which are targeted, intelligent, and very stealthy. So in this kind of environment where more and more sophisticated attacks and intrusion attempts are prevalent, it is not prudent for any decision makers to think the probability of a cyber attack and their consequences lightly. Then how often ransomware attacks are happening? First of all, uh, we can see that the frequency of ransomware attacks increased significantly uh, from every 40 seconds in 2016 to every 11 seconds in 2021. Looking at it more in detail, the figure on the right side shows that an individual consumer is attacked by ransomware every 10 seconds and an enterprise every 40 seconds. And it takes only 30 seconds to infect and encrypt a file. So this high cadence of attacks make it really difficult for anybody to deal with ransomware. And at the same time, it emphasizes again, the fact that ransomware attack is a serious and important issue all organizations are facing and it must be addressed strategically. Now, there are many people who say they have adequate prevention measures in place because they use antivirus products. They have thought that antivirus products are good enough to defend against the cyber attacks, including malware such as ransomware. However, unfortunately, the reality is that on average, only 25% of antivirus products are reported to be able to detect such malware attacks. Even well-known brand antivirus products such as McAfee and Kaspersky uh, have a detection rate of only 42%. This means 50% of ransomware attacks pass through without being detected. This is why we need additional measures in endpoint security to prevent ransomware. So in the next slide, Chris will introduce what basic methods are there uh, to prevent ransomware and other sophisticated cyber attacks. So I will give you a brief overview of the basics of how to prevent ransomware. First, uh, you should never click on any links or attachment contained in incoming emails. Secondly, uh, you should be able to use a scanning tool 
to detect malware that may be embedded in your email. Third, and furthermore, the installation of not only firewalls, but also especially endpoint protection product is important and essential. Endpoint products, of course, along with antivirus engines, have been recently introduced to EDR, uh, endpoint detection and response products. Fourth, if emails are from outside, admin in charge of the uh, email network or system must notify users inside the organizations for their attention. Fifth, uh, it is a natural process, but as it cannot be overemphasized, uh, it is necessary to back up all latest data in a safe places to recover data that has been encrypted by ransomware in the future. Finally, you must regularly change or securely manage users' credentials, including password. Here we will briefly uh, introduce the latest trends and future of ransomware in 2021. Uh, first, since the COVID-19 pandemics, ransomware attacks targeting remote employees have been on a massive scale and will become even clearer in 2021. Consequently, remote workers uh, targeted by ransomware were exposed to endpoint vulnerabilities. Additionally, due to the frequent occurrence of cyber incidents involving identity-based identity vulnerabilities, many enterprises are now increasingly aware of zero-trust security. From the zero-trust security point of view, I just mentioned, remote workers' endpoint security is very important. In order to do that, of course, not only antivirus, but also EDR product must be installed for achieving zero trust security. I hope that this presentation by Mi Jung and myself was helpful in understanding the recent increase in ransomware related in uh, incidents. From now on, uh, we will conduct a Q&A session with David. Uh, Chris Mi Jung, thank you so much for sharing your insight on the cybersecurity because because of pandemic, uh, we are entering the digital era a lot faster than before. And because of the COVID-19, it's actually the digital transformation has been accelerated in many organizations and companies, whether they like it or not. So it means that they are more exposed to the cyber attacks and without knowing or without realizing, actually they are in trouble, in danger every day. So one of the companies that I know also has been in trouble for, for this one. Personally, I know them. And then they said that uh, they had the ransomware, so they had to pay the hackers a lot of money. But of course, they cannot expose it to the public because they're thinking about their image as a company. But then uh, many people don't realize it until they actually experience it or until they have that situation. So that's why the, my question for um, either you, that many organizations think that spending on cybersecurity is simply too costly because they don't want to pay for it or they just adopt the minimum measures because they see them as unnecessary fixed costs. I, I know this is about the mindset, but uh, it's also true that they feel like, I don't want to spend too much money on the cybersecurity because we never know what's going to happen. So why do I have to waste my money? They, that's the way they think. What was your take on that? So that is true. Um, as I said in the presentation, you know, I meet uh, sometimes quite a few CEOs and uh, CEOs are saying something similar uh, to what you just described. And sometimes the CTOs have a hard time to convince their decision makers for allocating, you know, big budget for implementing cybersecurity measures. But as we went over in the presentation earlier, we really need to see this one from a more productivity perspective in organization because we show the increasing cost associated with the downtime and recovery time you know, after ransomware attacks. And this is directly affecting and hurting productivity in your organizations. So in today's environment where the risk to your company's assets and business continuity is rapidly increasing, protecting your organization by putting adequate resources in the right cybersecurity measures. It's not just the spending the money, throwing away the money, but it is a very, very smart investment. 
Yeah, without a doubt. Um, actually, I really hope that uh, people can understand that um, the potential danger of this uh, cyber attack. I remember that when I watched the Hollywood movies, what we watch uh, is that hackers are so fast in typing something and then trying to get into the system. And that was very impressive. Based upon what you just present today, maybe that's not the case anymore. There's a belief that people think that hackers mostly target the servers or network. Is it, is it correct, Chris? More you know, precisely saying, I would say that uh, hacking occurs in you know, all IT assets in the organizations, such as servers and endpoint PCs through the network. That's more you know, precise answers on your questions. So actually, uh, when we talk about the endpoint, because just in case that uh, some viewers are not familiar with this uh, terminology, endpoint mostly means not the servers, not network, it's more like what we use every day, right? Like a smartphones or laptops or desktop computers. Those are the that, endpoints. Yeah? Th that is correct. So yeah, it could be, you know, your uh, laptop or, you know, the workstation PCs and even you know, cell phones and, you know, uh, nowadays, you know, IoT, so Internet of Things, could be the end point that you have to, you know, protect from against, you know, those uh, threats from outside. Actually, th that's why uh, we need to protect the end point very well, because that's where we work every day. So in this pandemic era, cybersecurity is becoming more important. And what is the situation in organizations now? Do you see increasing uh, demand for cybersecurity measures across market sectors? Let me start with the COVID-19 and uh, uh, the rise of uh, remote working environment in the United States. I guess it's you know the, all over the uh, world, it's a semi uh, similar trend. So COVID-19 has really changed our work environment in very profound way. And now as uh, COVID-19 situation is getting a little bit better after the vaccine rollout, here in the United States, employers are slowly calling employees back to office. However, um, during the pandemic, even corporates also realize that there are many benefits of continuing, you know, the remote working. Uh, one example being like, you know, saving uh, office space and commercial real estate and saving tra transportation costs and et cetera. So this trend of remote working or uh, at least the hybrid model of, you know, the office and remote working together will continue for uh, some time being. Uh, but the challenge is that uh, remote employees use PCs and other devices to access companies' central resources remotely, often in a very unsecured environment, such as using home and Wi-Fi networks and public, you know, the clouds that companies don't have any control over. So hackers and you know, cyber criminals are very well aware of this vulnerability, security weaknesses of a home working environment, and they continue to try to infiltrate, you know, corporate the central system through uh, remote working employees, endpoint devices, or the connections. So here in the United States, where I am, uh, is very close to many uh, US government agencies and government contractors. So we see here the trends that more and more companies are learning about the importance of the endpoint security and the danger uh, of the, um, the security breaches. And many industries and business experts are hold, holding informational webinars and, and you know, the forums related to that topic. From the perspective of hackers, I think this is really profitable business. If they were able to penetrate the system and if they can distribute the malware or ransomware successfully, then they can actually demand a hot uh, ransom and then they make a easy money and very quick money because otherwise the, the company or organizations don't work, cannot work. So in that sense, I think this looks, looks like a really lucrative business and very attractive in a way. But defending the system can be very challenging is also true. Uh, so in that sense, I think um, in most cases, endpoint detection and response, or we call it EDR, requires a cloud connectivity. Does this mean that the uh, endpoint protection could be delayed without cloud-enabled connections? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, connecting to cloud is necessary for sophisticated analysis of suspicious files and you know, process founding in EDR. 
Uh, if a suspicious threat is detected, the uh, EDR agents on the endpoint suspend the execution of the file or process in real time. In other words, uh, there is no delay due to the connection to cloud. It could mm. be an uh, answer. So in the old time, I remember that when we have this kind of virus in the system, we could see that whether it's an um, extension file name that .com or .exe, for example, the mm -hmm. so-called execution files. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, it's not the case. Even if it looks like image file, it can be also still infected, right? Mm -hmm. So how can we know that whether it's a virus or not, or a ransomware or not, how can we detect them exactly? So nowadays, that's why they also have this uh, sandbox system, because when we have this new, let's say the file, or it doesn't look like a virus at all, it doesn't look like a ransomware or malware, since we are not sure about it, we have to send them to the sandbox. So my question is, what happens if a ransomware or malware is inactive when it is sent to a sandbox? Is there any way to detect malware or ransomware while it is still in inactive? Yes, um, I think, David, you are uh, probably referring to ransomware or malware attack that bypasses the sandbox. Uh, in the past, it was common for attacks to be file-based and not run for a certain period of time in the sandbox. But recently, fileless ransomware or malware without an executable file has become much, much more popular. But regardless, even though not as popular anymore, these sandbox bypass attacks can now be detected by monitoring anomalies such as the traffic and processes that occur on endpoints. So some people think that having too much cybersecurity could compromise productivity or work efficiency since repeated checks delay work and other schedules. What is your take on this? People are concerned about it. I also agree on that part. Uh, in my opinion, in order to minimize the work delay, uh, you can skip unnecessary or redundant verification process by registering frequently used or trusted business programs or, or site within the organizations. Is there any, let's say, the currently an all-in-one solution? For example, could endpoint prevention, visibility detection, and response capabilities converge into a single endpoint product? Is this conceivable at present? Well, that's a very good question. And uh, at the same time, it is a difficult question to answer, like any other questions about predicting trends in the future. Uh, currently, the approach is a multi-layered and comprehensive response by linking the EDR solutions with other security products running within the organizations already. So recently, uh, the EDR solutions are innovating dramatically uh, in securing visibility, detection, and response by applying AI technology. So uh, what you are asked uh, may be possible in the future. And if it does become reality, it would likely be enabled by the application of AI, I think. When we talk about uh, adopting the new system or new technology, technology is available already in the market, but it's actually it's very difficult to help people to be familiar with the new system and get used to that. In many cases, uh, I remember that uh, I've met some company leaders before that they talk about the cybersecurity. Yeah, it's a big deal, but actually it's not going to happen to me. I mean, that kind of thinking they have. So they're in a way, you know, living in a comfort zone, believing that no, no, it's just uh, happens to another bank, not my bank. You know that there are leadership, we call like a top-down leadership or bottom-up leadership and stakeholder centricity and shareholder centricity. So when it comes to the adopting this kind of a endpoint defense or a cybersecurity, what is the key element for any organizations to actually implement it, adopt it? Uh, yeah, so it sounds, you know, pretty, you know, uh, hard to answer. Um, and let me share my you know, past experience first. I don't know whether 
you know, Mijong has different opinion, but at least uh, let me share my you know, personal uh, experience in the past. Uh, throughout my you know, past experience, I believe that uh, we have to take the uh, top-down approach uh, in terms of you know, understanding or you know, convincing you know, people who actually adopt this kind of uh, you know, systems. So I believe uh, the management people or at least you know, CEO of the organizations must understand the you know, necessity of you know, cybersecurity product uh, in their organizations. Uh, head of the company must aware of that uh, the the essential of the cybersecurity product, and the CEO must have some kind of intent to bring this kind of system into their organizations. So again, you know, a top down approach, you know, leadership must be uh, take actions on that. Uh, Michong, do you also have your opinion on this based upon your experiences? Yeah, I, I also agree with uh, what uh, Chris just has mentioned. Uh, but uh, if I uh, just put myself into some of the, those leaders' position to their point, and um, well, I I can you know say there is a, some validity to uh, what they're saying because uh, business it's all about. ROI, return on investment, or the risk versus reward. So uh, I do understand, you know, the where they are coming from. Uh, however, uh, through our, you know, presentation, uh, as we, uh, you know, focus and, and emphasize many times, we should uh, see these cybersecurity issues uh, from a different perspective, a business perspective, whether it is productivity uh, or as we explained many times uh, throughout, you know, presentation, I think we should and those leaders should see this one as a from a different uh, business perspective, which is productivity perspective, right? So downtime and recovery costs due to the ransomware breaches cost, you know, uh, but not having sufficient or adequate cybersecurity are getting higher and higher. And then it's going to lead to lower productivity, even to recoveries. So uh, I think it takes the leadership and uh, also vision and also mindset of, you know, the investment. So I totally agree with what uh, Chris has just mentioned. Uh, it requires a leadership. Well, actually, we talk about the cybersecurity uh, prevention mostly because we really have to prevent uh, cyber attacks. And that's why we talked about so also EDR system and we talked about the antivirus and all this uh, cybersecurity. So maybe we can also talk about the damage control the, when it comes to, let's say, the EDR. Uh, we focus on detection and response. However, if a malware or ransomware attack has already occurred, how can you perform the damage control? Can you recommend any specific measures? Of course, you know, prevention is the most important you know, fact that, you know, uh, yeah, of course. However, uh, we must assume that there's no security product is perfect. In the event of an intrusion caused by malware or ransomware, the best way we can proceed with countermeasures according to the playbook you know, that must be you know established in the organizations in edr uh, there is a agent edr and agent list uh, edr actually it sounds very very difficult uh, can you explain why we need both yes uh, to make a, a long story short um, i recommend installing both agent and agent list products in order to ensure visibility across the network within the organization. So to elaborate, uh, agent list products focus on securing network visibility, uh, whereas agent products focus on securing endpoint visibility. So protect both, protect the entire system. I suddenly remember that one company in Korea has been hacked and then they were also fined by the government. I believe this uh, hacking incident that happened in Korea is worthwhile sharing with the viewers as a cautionary tale. This was a typical cyber attack case of spear phishing. Spear phishing is an email or electronic communication scam targeted towards a specific individual, organization, or business. Although often intended to steal data for malicious purposes, cyber criminals may also intend to install malware on a targeted user's computer. 
So what happened with this one of the largest online shopping malls in Korea was the hackers first infected the employee PC with malicious code or malware through a spear phishing. The hackers impersonated the brother of one of the staff and sent emails to the employee's personal email with malicious codes to penetrate the company's network. The malicious code spread to multiple terminals and collected the internal information. After gaining control of the computer that was connected to the database server, the hackers could access the server, hijack the personal information such as the user IDs and passwords and screens send them to themselves. The hackers took advantage of the vulnerabilities such as password management and server access control management. And this all happened just for four days, but the damage was so big. So what are the consequences of this hacking incident in Korea? The Korea Communication Commission or KCC, Korea's telecommunications watchdog, decided to impose a fine of 4.5 billion won or 3.8 million US dollars on this large company for its failure to protect the information of customers. League of the personal information of 10.3 million customers, such as their user ID, passwords, as well as their cell phone numbers and addresses. The hackers sent emails to the company executives asking for 3 billion won or 2.66 million US dollars in bitcoins, a virtual currency exchangeable online. I hope this does not sound like a fear mongering. This kind of hacking incident can happen to any organization, anyone. Be reminded this company already had cybersecurity protections on their network and their servers, but once the endpoint was compromised, that was all. So this is the consequence that you would get if you have no protection for your endpoint. And this is why people talk about the endpoint protection being so important and crucial lately. And it was because they couldn't protect the information of a customer in a hacking attack. So I think I better, uh, you know, share my another uh, past experience I have seen uh, in the local level. This is an example of how the phishing email attack happened to a small uh, CPA firm. This CPA firm was providing payroll and other accounting services for, you know, companies uh, located in the area where I live. Uh, one day, uh, one of the CPA firm, you know, employees mistakenly uh, clicked on uh, you know, a link attached to a suspected phishing uh, email. However, uh, the CPA firm was not aware of the breach until after a long time, they were informed by a security, cybersecurity you know, agency that the CPA firm's customer's data had been compromised. After the breach, um, you know, CPA firm hired a professional recovery service provider to install data recovery and you know, security products. Furthermore, uh, the CPA firm notified almost all customers via mail that the data had been uh, exfiltrated. Finally, CPA firm provided identity theft protection services and free credit score you know, monitoring services to their you know, customers. Indeed, the CPA firm had to pay a huge prices for damages and costs. The lesson I'd like to you know, stress here is that you know, these cyber incidents no longer happen to large-scale companies or institutions, but can happen to small-scale companies, even to me and you. Yeah, it can happen to anybody. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think this cybersecurity issue has a lot to do with the APO, the Asian Productivity Organization. The APO has been promoting the centrality of productivity, and there is a no doubt that productivity is the main driver to lift the economy up of many countries and companies from poverty and can even be the main driver for a thriving economy. In that vein, cybersecurity in the digital era is closely related to productivity. As I pointed out uh, during our presentation today, uh, many people mistakenly believe that cybersecurity is uh, something nice to have, but not a must. That is a dangerous belief that has resulted in grave trouble for many who became victims of cybercrime and identity theft. In my opinion, Cybersecurity is something very serious and something very significant for the APO to consider promoting for better productivity. Chris and Mijang, thank you so much for sharing your insight on the cybersecurity for productivity. 
And what you just shared with us actually means a lot because just uh, as m i z o n g shared and also Chris shared, the productivity we talk about all the time, productivity is the driver of a materialistic uh, prosperity as well as the people's well-being and happiness. So thank you so much for your valuable time again and uh, also the, for sharing your great insight and uh, your knowledge on this topic. v i e w e r s thank you so much for joining us today. So please don't forget what Chris has said. It happens to everyone every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Cyber attack can happen to anybody. It's not just happens to the big companies that we are familiar with. And what just m i z o n g said also, we really have to think about this cybersecurity issue from the perspective of productivity. On that note, I would like to close this interview. Stay well and stay healthy. And don't forget to be happy in this pandemic era. Stay tuned. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Otherwise, you are going to miss out on a lot. So see you next time, everyone. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.